Thank you so much for joining us on The Dwelling Show. I'm your host, Ola Dantes. I've got an incredible, legendary guest with us today, Brian Spear. Hey, Brian, how's it going, sir? Never had a bad day in my life, Ola. It's uh, <laughs> nice to be here, bud. Yeah, no, really, really excited to have you. Um, really love your story. Um, can't wait to hear you know more about you. So yeah, maybe let's just dive right into it. Just tell the listeners who you are, um, kind of what you've been doing and kind of what you've been up to lately, actually. Yeah, uh, I'll try to be brief here. I could drone on for hours, man, but uh, Keep you, going. You, everybody's got a sob story, right? I'll give you a little bit of mine. Um, it didn't grow up in a very affluent environment. Uh, my parents got divorced when I was a youngster, 10 years old. My dad moved to Gary, Indiana, which was known as the murder capital of the world in the 1990s. And uh, my mom, she actually moved to the south side of Chicago and moved into a trailer park. So while today we invest in mobile home parks and parking lots, that's what we do. We own a lot of stuff on the eastern half of the country. My first experience with mobile home park investing was actually living in one when I was 10 years old, right? So, um, you know, that NIMBY syndrome of not in my backyard and that's a stigma associated with trailer trash and stuff never adversely affected me because I was one of those guys, right, growing up. So um, all well and good. In any event, um, I, I just knew that I needed to get out of that situation, right? Even at a young, early age, it was all about trying to get my family in a better financial position. So worked extremely hard, um, both academically and athletically to get to some, some scholarship money. I knew that I didn't have a, um, enough capital to go buy a degree to go to college. So wanted to get some scholarship money. Ended up graduating fifth in my high school class, ended up choosing baseball as the sport because I wasn't tall enough to play basketball, wasn't uh, strong enough to play football, but you could be any size and shape to play baseball. And then I taught myself how to hit both right-handed and left-handed so that I could get more notoriety to get uh, some scholarship offers. Ultimately landed at the University of Kentucky. And uh, by the time that I graduated, uh, was voted captain of the team there, was one step beneath academic All-American. So just shy of, of, uh, of, of, of you know, having that claim to fame of being All-American here in the, uh, in the States. But um, uh, in any event, um, shortly thereafter, I knew that I wanted to get involved in investing. And the reason is because I was taking an accounting course when I was 21 years old in Memorial Hall at the University of Kentucky, for any of your listeners that are familiar with that. And it's an old famous building. It's got about 300 students in Memorial Hall. And, you know, eight o'clock in the morning or whatever, everybody's coming in in their sleeping pants and uh, half of them are still asleep. They haven't had their coffee. And the professor is giving us a lecture on the power of compound interest. And I, you know, 250 people are in here, they're still sleeping, they're, they're, you know, not paying much mind. And I'm, I'm, he's conveying to me the power of compound interest. And I'm looking around, go, are you guys hearing this right now? I mean, I, I've got no money, nothing, you know, nothing to, to in my bank account, probably got 15 bucks, eat at Little Caesars every night, you know, because it's, it's going to give us the most value, value play, right. And um, I knew in that moment that I was going to be a millionaire, it was just going to take time. But I knew that if I just put a little bit of a prudent um, capital to work year over year over year over a long period of time that I was going to be successful and could potentially change my family tree in one generation. So anyway, when I graduated, that's what I thought about doing. I uh, was fortunate to get a few different job opportunities shortly after uh, school, um, traveled around the country as a telecommunication SOX auditor for a while, making a pretty good chunk of change, six figures, saving a good amount of money in my 20s, building piles of cash investing it in the stock market at that time, but ultimately wanting to turn it into streams of income and get involved in commercial real estate investing. Um, needed to, uh, wanted to scale as quickly as I could, um, as opposed to try to reinvent the wheel from scratch. Uh, was very fortunate in my 20s to help build a business from, from basically nothing. I was one of six employees. I was number six on an, a business that started from scratch, built up into a valuation of over 50 million bucks, has subsequently been sold, but I didn't own any equity in that business. So I wanted to, um, uh, again, own equity in a real estate venture and found somebody that had the, the historical skill set and the track record. Um, and I knew that I could put some, some gasoline on the embers that he had already kind of created and uh, I partnered up with him. 2014 went full time. We've been doing uh, mobile home park investing, trying to scale up that business um, uh, since that point, ever, ever since that point. So. Uh, back in the day, we were doing individual deals, deals with friends and family, JV Capital, and now we're a fully functioning private equity firm. It's our third uh, uh, growth and in income fund that we just rolled out. And, you know, just looking to continue to scale, buy as many mobile home parks and parking lots as possible, help as many people as possible generate cash flow and build legacy wealth through these 
phenomenal asset classes, man. So everybody's got a sob story. That's mine, man. Man, I was almost going to say drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was good. That was yeah. good. I mean, th- there was just so many angles in which you like kind of hit. Um, I do want to, I, I want to touch on something though. Mm-hmm. So you joined, you know, you joined this, this partner, right? I'm guessing they were more experienced than you. They knew a little right. bit more. Um, but you thought, you look, you know, I, I can work with, you know, for you or with you kind of with a nine to five mentality. But you decided to say, hey, I actually want some skin in the game, right? Because mm-hmm. I think I can actually add value here. Um, why didn't you go start your own company? I knew that I could get... Um, from where I was to where I wanted to be quicker, if I could leverage the skill set of others. Um, you know, from my perspective, I'm always, I've always been fond of the, the partnership mentality. One plus one does not equal two, but 11. And you're able to, to scale a little bit quicker. No man is an island. And if I've seen further than others, it is only because I've stood on the shoulders of giants, right? We can't do this ourselves. So um, I knew that I had a unique skill set coming from a business literally where we started from nothing. Um, The founder of the business that I'm referring to is called the Brogdon Group, his name is David Brogdon. And back after the great recession, um, he started his own firm, okay? There were three partners in his prior business. When the great recession occurred, two of them wanted to basically lay off a litany of folks and try to continue taking profits in the manner that they had historically been taking. David Brogdon did not want to do that. He wanted to retain all the employees, keep them on the payroll, even during that tough time. And he was willing to take a hit. So it created friction in the partnership. He branched off, started his own thing. And he asked just a handful of people to come along for the ride with him. I was one of those folks. I was one of six that started that from scratch. And I remember when we started that business, again, he's got his little office space. And, you know, it's one of these things. You go to Walmart, you, you buy a little card table. That's that fold-out table and these fold-out chairs. And, the, you know, it's five, six of us sitting in the room trying to make this thing happen and, and create contracts with AT&T, Verizon, massive multi-billion dollar multinational companies. And starting from that, growing that business up into a eight-figure business that ultimately has subsequently been been sold full cycle, I knew what it was like to scale something small, take it and make it something larger. And I could bring that to a, a smaller entrepreneurial real estate investor that had had some great success, had an exceptional business model. And I knew that I could 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 help scale that. Um, so that's ultimately why I reached out. You, my business partner is Kevin Buff. Some folks may be familiar with him. He's got a podcast very similar to what you have. It's been very, very popular over many years. It's called Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow with Kevin Buff. Been downloaded millions of times by folks in over 190 countries and loved his business model. Um, at the time when I reached out to him, um, he, he it was just small. He was just small doing stuff himself, uh, personal capital, capital, friends and family. And I basically reached out to him and said, hey, buddy, I got an offer you can't refuse. I'm going to come down to Florida. I'm going to work for you full time. I'm going to bust out 60, 70 hours a week. I'm not going to ask you to pay me a dime. Don't pay me a dime. I'm going to bring hundreds of thousands of dollars, invest in the business and help you grow your business. And I think that we can you know, put some, put some juice in it and scale it up um, into something that's pretty solid. So that's ultimately how we came together, you know, 2014. So you know, looking back now, I it's wish, been a fun I wish ride. You me. I wish you called me and gave me that offer. <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 a tough one to refuse, right? I gave him my resume. I I've been able to do some pretty cool things along the way, and um, interestingly, at the very his very first uh, response was a little bit of hesitancy because it's it's the old too good to be true sort of thing, right? So a little bit of hesitancy. Um, continue to be persistent, and uh, you know, send deals, do this, that, or the other, and eventually earn earn trust over time. So that was kind of how it. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm kind of curious. I'm I'm thinking like a like a listener, right? So I'm in my car, I'm listening to this guy. I'm like, whoa, hold on a second. Like, I'm on my way to work. Like, I can't just move to another city or go meet someone and work for free for how many many months? Like, like how do you do that? Like mentally, and then like obviously physically, and then financially. Curious. I'm just curious. No, all great stuff. A couple of points here. There are many wasted minutes in the day, from my perspective, for most folks. Um, And and when you're first getting started, uh, there's going to be a little bit of that uh, hustle and grind mentality in order to get some semblance of experience. But at some point, if you truly want to go full time, 
and uh, change your, your, your family's trajectory, there's some risk associated with that, no doubt about it. Um, the goal from my perspective, when you're taping that, taking that leap of faith is to get the boat as close to the dock as possible before you jump off and take the leap to go full time. Um, so, you know, just thinking about it from your listener's perspective a little bit, I mean, and also from the GP side, from my side, what we're doing right now, um, we've had a handful of folks over time reach out very similar to what you're referring to, that they've got full-time jobs, they make pretty good income, but they want to go full-time and they're looking to try to find a way to add value, et cetera. Um, that can certainly be done. Um, a lot, a lot, well, I'll just use this as an example. Uh, three things that uh, need to occur to make deals happen, right? You got to find the money, you got to find the deal, and you got to operate the deal. To your point, you can't really operate the mobile home park or the parking lot or the multifamily property from a distance if you're not full time. You can't really do that, but you can potentially go find the deals. You don't need to be actively all day, every day working on. Uh, that side of the business in order to find the deals. From my perspective, you, you can uh, do it in off times. You can do it on the weekends. You can cold call owners on the weekends. You can send out direct mail. And those marketing pieces are working for you when you're not even, you know, sitting there actually sending it out. The person's receiving that mail while you're, you know, doing your nine to five on, at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. And then those sort of ad hoc conversations can occur while you're still um, doing your, your nine to five, if you will. And you're gaining some some skills along the way. You're getting a ton of free education through all these podcasts that are available, such as yours, and having at least some base level, uh, and then reaching out to folks that have some experience that have a need and, and looking to fill that void um, for even a, a reasonable uh, wage. It's, it's imminently achievable. And I would say even more achievable today than it was even 12 months ago, right? Before the pandemic, folks working remotely was so much, it was, it was less common. But today it is so commonplace. It, it, you, people don't even look twice and balk twice when you know folks are in their kitchen or whatever and doing Zoom calls. It's, it's normal now. So I think it's an easier path if you want to get involved. Um, you can add value even part-time before and, and try to get that boat as close to the dock as possible before taking that leap of faith. That's kind of uh, my thoughts. Yeah, I really like that. I love that you that you mentioned that. So now let's kind of shift a little bit to a deal. So, you know, what was your actual first deal? Um, and then maybe maybe talk about your like your first tiny deal and then your first first deal where you had to like raise funds, syndicate the deal and, and things like that. I'm just kind of curious to kind of see that the contrast. Yeah, so I'll go uh, first uh, first personal deal where I was considered a JV equity partner um, uh, in our firm was a deal in Alabama, beautiful MSA, Athens, Alabama growing, or excuse me, uh, the Hoover, Hoover MSA, or, uh, excuse me, oh my gosh, um, I'm butchering the MSA, but anyway, it's in Athens, Alabama. It was a mobile home park called Blackburn Mobile Home Park, 68 spaces and located this deal um, off market, direct to owner, vast majority of deals we've ever done have been off market, direct to owner. That's the core competency of my business partner. You know, he's been doing this over 20 years, going off market, direct to owner, knocking on doors, cold call campaigns, all that sort of stuff. And that was what I needed um, to help kind of scale the business. We need deal flow. Um, so this came about as a, 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 a lead from a direct mail piece. And after a handful of uh, negotiation conversations back and forth with the with the seller, we ended up acquiring this deal for roughly $700,000. Uh, again, this is a six, 68 space mobile home park. Um, at the time, there were 45 homes inside of that community. And from my perspective, again, in the mobile home park industry, what you'll find if you want to get involved is that there's a lot of operational inefficiency, a lot of mom and pop operators. And this guy, he wasn't, uh, I wouldn't say he was unsophisticated. He owned a lot of uh, assets. In fact, he owned a fair amount of multifamily properties in the vicinity, but that was the only mobile home park that he owned. Um, he owned a lot of different types of, of real estate, but he knew nothing about mobile home park investing and mobile home park investing. It's just a unique beast. It just is. He was trying to operate his community like a horizontal apartment complex. We see that all the time in the industry, and that doesn't necessarily work. That same exact business model doesn't necessarily work when you come over into the uh, mobile home park space. So as opposed to having a tenant owned home community with a low expense ratio, where the tenants own their own homes, they fix all the toilets, trash and termite, he owned all of the units himself. And he had 45 park owned homes that were just 
residents that were extremely transient, um, uh, extremely high ex operating expense ratio, while he did have more revenue than he would have otherwise had if it were a tenant owned home community, all that revenue was coming in one, one door and out the other and out the back. So he wasn't making any money. Um, we were able to negotiate the acquisition off of his real numbers, his actual NOI, and knew very quickly that we were going to be able to change that community from a park-owned home community to a tenant-owned home community, lower the operating expense ratio, remove the cable. Um, I could go on and on, uh, but long so story short. With the, with the homes though, so you guys sold it to the new tenant? I'm curious. Correct. So at the time of acquisition, the units were being rented for roughly $550 per month. And at that time, the lot rent in the immediate vicinity for other mobile home parks in the immediate vicinity was hovering in like the $200 range, uh, which would kind of give you a, a, a if you're going to break that $600 payment down, uh, or I, I think it was about 550, if you're going to break it down, $200 would have been allocated to the lot rent and about 350 would have been allocated to the home rent piece. Um, when we went ahead and, and uh, um, acquired that property, we went to every single resident and we said the same thing. Hey guys, we got an offer you can't refuse. We got an offer. You get, you're not, you're going to love me. Listen to this guys. Here you go. Right now you're renting this for 550 bucks. We are going to let you be the owner of this. Oh, the community. same price. And, and it'll be the same price. In <laughs> fact, if you want to go ahead and do it, we'll make it 525. Oh my gosh. We'll make it 525, right? We'll lower but you it. Didn't you didn't tell them you also buying the headache. You're going to fix your own toilets. Time rights. I agree. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the business model because it just, it, it, it affords us an opportunity to, again, lower the overall operating expense ratio. Mobile homes are in fact depreciating assets. And to your point, you're correct. Um, it's a little bit less out of pocket uh, for them on a monthly basis to us. They will have an uptick in the maintenance, no doubt about it. Um, but what it also does for the community is when they're tenant owned homes, it attracts a much, care. much, much better. Yeah, they resident. take care of the property. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It bolsters the pride of ownership and they become so much more sticky. Um, as mentioned, a lot of those folks were transient. They were only there for like a year. And when you turn it into a tenant owned home community, they stay forever. The most tenured resident in our portfolio has been renting their, or excuse me, has been renting their lot for over 40 years. Over 40 years. Yeah, it's unbelievable. So once you can turn it into a tenant owned home community, you're in a very good position. Anyway. Long story short, expediting the process, we turned as many of those folks into tenant-owned homes as, as possible, brought in an additional uh, amount of homes along the way to fill some of those vacant spots, and ultimately decided to sell that community. We ended up selling it this past year for roughly 1.5 million, something like that. So we doubled the value. And what um, was the entry point? Time. About half, half of that? Yeah, 700K. So um, again, a modest sized asset but a great return, a good yield, a nice IRR for everybody involved, a good deal, good little deal, right? Um, um, and then you'd asked about kind of our bigger stuff that we've done over time. We started doing fund structures. Uh, you know, the deals that we're doing uh, in, in mobile home park land are, are oftentimes more modest in size, our average transaction size, a couple few million bucks. So um, when you're rolling out individual deal specific syndications at that size, you can certainly do so, but we, we had sufficient deal flow such that it, we would have been putting out a lot of paperwork and a lot of legal documentation if we were going to do an individual deal specific syndication every time we had a $2 million deal. So we decided to move forward in a more formal fund structure starting in 2017. And it was a modest equity allocation. We ended up raising about 5 million bucks, put five different mobile home parks in that respective fund. Um, it's been going for roughly three years right here. Uh, the first deal we took down was in the third quarter, 2017. Last deal we took down in fund one was in the second quarter, 2018. So it's been going for about three years now. Um, and you know we've been fortunate to be able to pay out annual yields of about 8% rough shot. And then also via refinance proceeds. And we also sold our New York portfolio and sent that capital back to partners. Um, we've been able to return all the original capital back to partners as well. And they retain their equity in the investments and all future proceeds are split 60, 40. That's a 60, 40 split where they retain 60%. Wow. But, um, wow. That's yeah, awesome. that that's it's awesome. going well. And the fund structure, again, there's benefits and drawbacks up 
uh, going into fund as opposed to a deal specific syndication. Um, the fund will get you a little bit more diversification. It smooths out that ride, smooths out the returns, uh, but it precludes those massive spikes where either you, you could potentially hit this massive, massive grand slam or potentially have a, a little bit uh, of underperformance, if you will. So, you know, ebbs and flows dependent upon uh, what the investor's appetite is, but we prefer the fund structure. No, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I mean, obviously we can just keep going on and on, but we're now dwelling into the quick round. There's a bunch of quick questions. Yeah. Quick answers. You ready, sir? Go ahead, bud. All right. First question. What makes you unique? What is that differentiating factor that separates you from the next guy or the next girl, Brian? I would say personally or business, but personally or business. We can do personally. Personally, I would say wit. Um, and I'm not saying wit because I'm funny. I'm saying with the acronym, whatever it takes, you know, truly persistent, whatever it takes, willing to do whatever it takes to go ahead and, and, and be successful. I always try to say I've been successful in everything that I've ever done, not because I've never failed. I failed over and over and over and over again, but don't quit. Just keep moving and do whatever it takes to be successful. Love it. Second question. What was the last book that you read? And what was the one thing that you picked up from that book? No, uh, I, I need to get this one. I need to get this one because it is so good. You've got to read it. Dan Sullivan's most recent one. Dan Sullivan is the founder of, um, are you familiar with EOS, uh, Gina Wickman's EOS? Um, no. Entrepreneur operating system, no worries. Um, no. But Gina Wickman's mentor was Dan Sullivan. And Dan Sullivan just came out with a new book and it's basically about delegating. Um, my sincerest apologies. The it's absolutely crushing me that I can't find this right now. Um, <laughs> I, I I googled for you. So is it who who not how? Is that it? Who not how? Boom. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, okay. man. Who not how? It's about asking better questions. When somebody has a problem, oftentimes somebody that has a less stern backbone will say, "I can't do it." somebody will put a challenge in front of them and they'll say, I can't do it. You need to ask better questions. The next best question will say, how can I do it? How can I do it? And they'll find a way to do it, whatever it takes. But the best question that you can ask is who can do it for me? Who can do it for me? And if you think through it in that manner, um, you'll be able to scale it significantly quicker. Uh, so who not how uh, is, is what it's about. It's about delegating and elevating out of those more mundane tasks to allow you to scale quicker. Absolutely phenomenal book. No, thanks for sharing that. I definitely will be I'm adding that to my Amazon um, cart. Um, last question, you're busy, you're running your portfolio. What do you do for fun? Lift weights. Nice. I'm a dork, I'm a dork. And it's been rough because uh, this past year I haven't really hit the gym gym per se, uh, but I'm a meathead. Folks will let you know that. Again, I was captain of the team at the University of Kentucky. And as a joke, and it wasn't because I was the best player, okay? There were six big leaguers on the team, but I just worked really hard. And as a joke, around Christmas, you always, you always get assigned a different member of the team and they give you a gift. Well, my gift was a cardboard cutout and somebody drew a key on it. And they were like, here's the key to the weight room because I'm a meathead. I enjoy <laughs> lifting weights, man. It, it lets me uh, decompress and get the stress out. Nice, nice. So if somebody, you know, really likes your story, wants to connect with you, um, where's the best place people can reach out, get to know you more? Uh, I would say this, uh, our firm is Sunrise Capital Investors. If you guys want to learn more about what we do, again, we do our best to help as many people as possible generate cash flow, build legacy wealth through investing in mobile home parks and parking lots. You can go to investwithsunrise.com. Again, investwithsunrise.com. I'll tell you a little bit more about our current investment opportunity. Awesome, Brian. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hola. You're the best, man.